Okay, good evening and thank you for joining us for tonight's Early Pregnancy Problems um, in partnership with St George Hospital. My name is Bertha Harvey and I'm the CPD and Events Manager at Central East and Sydney PHN. Before we begin, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work, recognise the continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we have cultural awareness training on the 21st of June at Burwood Club RSL. You can register via our website. Uh, if you are after those elusive measuring outcomes and reviewing performance activities, uh, we do have State of the Heart Cardiology Series in partnership with the Eastern, Eastern Heart Clinic and the Sutherland Heart Clinic coming up. Uh, and that will be commencing on the 21st of June. So please visit our website to register for that. And just a quick update with the GP grants program, we do have information on our website and the applications close on the 15th of June for that. So I would like to hand over for our GP facilitator tonight, Dr. Martina Gleeson. Hi everybody um, and welcome to tonight's um, presentation. Just gonna share three slides to do with Health Pathways. Just a reminder that uh, you should use the Health Pathways um, site either Sydney or Southeastern Sydney based on where your patient will be accessing services. Uh, so if you're on the borderline um, and your patient's going to a service in Sydney Local Health District, use their pathways. And if they're going to somewhere in Southeastern Sydney, then use our pathways. Um, the pathways that are relevant to tonight's topic are listed here on this page for Southeastern Sydney, uh, including the first consult for antenatal care, miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy, and nausea and vomiting and hyperemesis in pregnancy, as well as the service information for our local antenatal clinics. And in a similar way, the Sydney Health Pathways um, also have the same relevant pathways and they have the service information for uh, Canterbury Hospital and RPA Hospital maternity units. So they could be helpful if you've got a patient going in that direction. I won't go into more detail. You're probably familiar with the other slides we share with Health Pathways. Um, so I will stop sharing and pass over to Kylie Turner, um, who is representing the integrated care um, group at St George Hospital that have started this process. I'm Kylie Turner and I'm the chronic kidney disease CNC at St George and also the chair of the Integrated Care Chronic Diseases Working Party. Um, we are now a group of around 20 plus um, staff members from not only St George but the Primary Health Network who work together at um, trying to connect the general practice community with the tertiary hospital and help to navigate services within the hospital. Um, we started this work back in 2017, where we started with some work around the discharge um, summary, which you may have seen. And we've since moved into um, the latest, which is the GP Grand Round series, which started um, in 2022 and is continuing in 2023. So we hope that you enjoy this series and please let me know if there's any particular topics that you're wanting to hear about um, for next year. And I'll hand over to um, Dr. Davis. Thanks very much for that, Kylie. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I've been a staff specialist at St. George since last century, um, quite literally. But um, I wanted to talk, I wanted first of all to thank uh, the committee for, or the working party for inviting me to talk talk to you tonight and also thank Bertha and her crew from the PHN for organising it as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I plan to cover bleeding in early pregnancy, miscarriage and ectopics, hyperemesis, and then uh, complications of pregnancy curatage. And most of these cases, well, all of these cases are recent cases that I've had, and that means that they're actually very common. The way I've approached it is there'll be two breaks for questions at sort of a third of the way in and then two thirds of the way in, and then time for questions at the end. Um, so. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's all going to be case-based. Um, so I'll start with my first lady, 32-year-old woman. 
she has had four pregnancies. Um, she's had one, one baby. She's been hypothyroid in the past. She's had in vitae screening and she was a carrier of the Leber congenital amaurosis, et cetera, which all of you will have never heard of and I had never heard of either. Um, but both she and her husband were, I mean, this is an, these are autosomal recessive conditions and both she, uh, her husband was negative for them. So we do nothing. So in her first pregnancy, um, she was there were concerns about growth and she was induced at 38 weeks and had an emergency caesar for fetal distress had a little baby so 2.5 kilos and as you see there the average is about 3.1 and there was a good recovery for both mother and baby uh, second pregnancy um she was seen i saw her at just over six weeks did an ultrasound, the, the, there was a gestational sac, which was smaller than expected, but no fetal pole. And her HCG was 12.56 and her progesterone was 12.3. And she had a spontaneous miscarriage a week later. So that's really the first point I wanted to make is that in normal pregnancy, HCG should double at or at least go up by 80% every 48 hours. And there's a lot of, there's a bit of debate about that. So um, in your health pathway, it says go up by two thirds, but it is very reassuring when it, when it doubles and I always feel more comfortable with that. And the progesterone should be greater than 45. So those are two important figures to mention. Um, so in a third pregnancy, her first HCG was, was 34. Uh, the next day it was 74 and the progesterone was 37. Um, and as I've just said on the previous slide, usually I would um, increase, I would give her progesterone in that um, situation. I don't know why I didn't, but I didn't. Uh, then, but you can see the HCGs are actually rising very nicely. So between the 13th and the 15th went from 74 to 259 and then um quadrupled uh in the next one she however she started bleeding and um five days later her hcg had dropped to 146 and her progesterone was 2.2 so she um wanted full investigations for this and usually we only do it after three miscarriages or if there's a suggestion of antiphospholipid syndrome so she'd had clots or a family history of clotting maybe had an, an abruption or something like that then um potentially would have would have done that but um that's what she wanted so the investigations that i do for recurrent miscarriage in the woman do a thrombophilia screen i uh, do vitamin d omega-3 and iodine um because all of these three vitamins have been shown low levels have been shown to be associated with um, miscarriage admittedly the omega-3 is in animals not in humans uh, i can't remember which animal um, but it's an easy one to replace and that's one of the nice things about those if they're low then you can replace them uh, you need to do a karyotype a sonohistogram to check that the uterine cavity is normal and usually I'd do thyroid antibodies and TSH because just having thyroid antibodies increases your risk of miscarriage as well. Um, really important, the, the man as well, the man is half the baby. So check his vitamin D and iodine um, karyotype because vitamin D and iodine have both been shown to, uh, low vitamin D and iodine have both been shown to um, reduce male fertility. And also check sperm DNA damage because particularly as men get older, they get more DNA damage, which contributes to the infertility, but also increases the rate of miscarriage as well. So all these tests are very expensive though. So that's why we don't, well, that's one of the reasons why we don't offer them after two miscarriages. 
Um, and the results for this lady were all normal apart from her omega-3, which was slightly low, 3.7%. Uh, and so we put her on omega-3. So in a current pregnancy, she early on, on the 23rd, her HCG was 110 and her progesterone was 67. So as I said, well above 45, but in view of what had happened, I started her on some progesterone. I also put her on some low-dose aspirin. The evidence that it makes any difference is very sketchy, um, but uh, I often feel it's nice to do something as long as it's safe in these women who have lost, who are very anxious, understandably. And if we look at her bloods on the 25th, her HCG was 337. Notice the progesterone, despite the fact that she's taking progesterone, is much the same, but her HCGs are rising very nicely. Then, so I finally saw her at just over six weeks and she had some nausea and vomiting. And my approach to that initially is when they come in and say they're feeling lousy, is to say that's fantastic um, because it's very reassuring that the pregnancy is progressing well when they have significant nausea and vomiting. And uh, they usually respond in a very, well, if that's feeling lousy, in a slightly more positive way. So I did an ultrasound then. It's the fetal pole was equivalent to dates, the six weeks, and the fetal heart was 103. We like it to be above 100 in this early stage, so 103 was a little bit concerning. So um, the following week, she was worse in terms of her nausea and vomiting, and I charted her some, or gave her a script for some metoclopramide and on Dancitron. Our ultrasound, the fetal pole was equal to dates, the fetal heart was okay as well. So um, she was seen the following week. She still had significant nausea and vomiting and she wasn't taking her medications. And I'm sure those of you that look after pregnant women, this is off a, a common scenario that even though they're feeling terrible, they're often very resistant to taking their medications. So, um, you know, I obviously that's their choice and you've got to leave that up to them. So what do we do next? And Martina has already mentioned your health pathway. This I think is relatively new and I think is an excellent um, review of it. So you click on women's health then pregnancy, pregnancy medical conditions, and then nausea, vomiting and hyperemesis and pregnancy. So it's a really good review and I'd, I'd recommend it. Um, the New South Wales health guidelines were updated in February of this year. It usually lasts from about seven to 14 weeks and resolves, but not always. Um, and calling it morning sickness, a woman often get incredibly irate about this because it's usually all day or all night sickness. And it's kind of trivializing it, um, I think. And uh, just as a little aside about 15 years ago, I went to Antarctica um, and sailed from a at the bottom end of the South America across to Antarctica and um, spent 48 hours in a, a small boat going up and down and was nauseated and vomiting for 48 hours and gave me a whole new respect for hyperemesis gravidarum. So it is a very serious, difficult condition, but we try the simple things first. And there is this wonderful test that uh, score sheet that you can do, which has such a wonderful name, the Puke 24 square score. So in the last 24 hours, how long have you felt nauseated or sick? So from not at all to more than six hours. In the last 24 hours, have you vomited or thrown up? Did not up to seven or more times. And seven or more times is really quite common in, in this condition. In the last 24 hours, how many times have you had retching or dry heaves without throwing up? And again, 
um, these women feel like they're about to vomit their esophagus out and it's often very distressing for them. So if their score is four to six, it's, we consider it mild. If it's seven to 12, it's moderate. And if it's greater than 12, it's severe or hyperemesis gravidarum. So I think the PUKE 24 score is excellent because it is a more objective assessment, both for the patients so they can see you know, where they sit and how severe it is. And also for the doctor as well, because sometimes some of them will surprise you both ways. So some of them will be not, not that sick at all and others they'll be horrible. So what are the initial treatments? Um, getting more rest, eating small amounts of food more often. And often these women just survive on dry carbs. And the next question they ask you is, you know, I'm not eating a good diet. What can I do? And, you know, there is really nothing they can do. And as long as they've been healthy before getting pregnant, then there's not much that's going to go wrong in the six to eight weeks that they have severe nausea um, and they you know they really don't need to eat it's the fluids that they need to keep up uh, so sipping small amounts more often ice blocks of anything that's fluid so all sorts of weird stuff I've heard of people freezing ginger um, is in a lot of things and has been around for thousands of years so some women find it helpful but if it's severe it really doesn't cut it um, avoiding large tablets. So the multivitamins, you know, they really are big tablets to swallow and a lot of them won't be able to swallow them. So as long as their folate's okay, that's not a problem. If it was low, then you can just get them to take folate tablets, which are a lot smaller and usually much more palatable. And um, B6 is sometimes helpful as well. The second line treatment, my approach to it with them is we've just got to focus on survival and that's how they feel. They just feel so lousy um, and they're just vomiting all the time. So um, metoclopramide is cheap. It has fewer side effects, but it's not very effective orally. Um, sometimes it's quite useful IM, so... Um, I will some if someone's got a real up kick in their um, nausea and vomiting, we'll get them to go along to their GP and have an IM shot and that will settle them down. Um, your health pathway says prochlorperazine. I find it's not much different in terms of efficacy compared to metoclopramide. The only thing is you can get it in suppository form. And some women find this more, um, I was going to say palatable, that's probably not the right word, acceptable. Um, on Dancitron is expensive. Constipation is a big problem with it, but it's more likely to be effective. IV fluids, it's really hard to know when to give them IV fluids. I usually leave the decision up to them and hopefully their partner um, if they really feel they're just not keeping anything down and particularly if their urine output is dropping, I tell them um, in private to ring us in the morning and I arrange to admit them overnight. They sometimes will come into ED and have fluids and um, there is a area-wide um, policy about to or a mis mission about to start looking at hospital and the home and sending them out um, to give IV fluids. But it's it's really interesting. I mean, one of the things about that is these women also have an incredibly increased, increasing sensitivity of, of uh, their noses. And it's often one of the real problems is that at home there are all these smells and so their cooking smells, their maybe dirty nappy smells, um, they're just the home smells. Sometimes it's their partner's smell. And when you say to them, you know, we just need to admit you overnight and there's this just 
this big sense of relief that they're going to be getting out of the, that environment for a while. So I think often admitting them to hospital is for respite as much as for the IV fluids. I don't routinely give them vitamin K if they are really sick. Occasionally, rarely, they'll need to have a nasogastric tube down. And if that's the case, they will often need um, to a dietitian involved and need vitamin K and other things. It's never made any sense to me why putting a nasogastric tube down will actually stop women vomiting, but it does seem to work. Um, so this is one of my pauses. Um, so any questions on miscarriage or nausea and vomiting in pregnancy? Hi, Greg, there's a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, one is, could you please comment on the dose of folic acid for women of advanced maternal age? Should they be taking a higher dose in the first trimester? Um, I, I, I don't routinely give them a higher dose. I mean, most of them that come in, certainly in private, will have had their folate measured. And, you know, if they've got a normal, and often they will have, you know, if they've been trying to get pregnant for a long time, then um, they will have enormously high folates. And so I don't think there's any reason to give them a higher dose um, unless they've got one of the, um, if for some reason they've, they've actually had their MTHFR um, mutations, if someone has actually exam has tested them for that and they've got a mutation, then I'll put them on a higher dose of folate for that for that reason, but not routinely just because of age. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the indication to give progesterone in early pregnancy and how much is given and how early? Yeah, um, can I just mention that's not in the health pathway at the moment, but that pathway is under review and it will be when we go live with the reviewed pathway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good question. The, the evidence for it is actually pretty sketchy. Um, and, and the big problem is no one really knows whether the progesterone is low because the pregnancy is failing um, or the pregnancy is failing because the progesterone is low. So, you know, if you replace it, does it make a difference? And as I said, the literature is pretty sketchy on that. But I mean, I, I guess my approach for it is these women are often incredibly desperate and not just the woman, the, the couple are incredibly desperate. My view is it might do some good. Um, it doesn't do any harm. Um, so that's why I use it. And I usually in early on in pregnancy will just put them on um, oral progesterone. So um, Prometrium, 100 milligrams a day. Um, and so I don't use a higher dose than that. Okay. Uh, the next, there's quite a few questions on the progesterone, but the next question is, do you measure blood or urine iodine? Um, I usually just, it's usually urinary iodine that, that they measure and mm -hmm. I just send off a form and they usually use, it's usually urine iodine. iodine. Okay. Um, I think we've answered the other two progesterone questions. So how effective is the acupressure wristband for nausea and vomiting? It's it's very good unless they're really sick. Um, <laughs> when they're really sick, you got to use everything, right? <laughs> yeah, and and so and that's exactly right, Martina. So, you know, if they just try everything, and you know, they, it, again, it's a completely safe thing to do, and it seems to work for some women. They find it helpful, and um, so yeah, so it's worth worth trying. Excellent. Uh, someone wanted to know if any lab can do the omega-3 measurements um, and are there trimester-specific ranges? No, then, um, to my knowledge, there are no trimester-specific ranges, um, but they get sent away to specific labs as well. So you can send them to any pathology group and they will send them away to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's pretty simple. You know, you saw the figures. They should be above whatever it is, 8 or 8% or 10%. And as I said, the, the the information on it so far is related to animals, not not to humans. But 
you know, omega-3 is important later on in pregnancy, particularly reducing the risk of preterm labor and things like that. So it's putting them on fish oil is, is a bit of a no brainer, I think. Mm -hmm. And do you have a particular supplement you recommend, or it's just like anything with omega-3 is probably better yeah, than nothing? I think, yeah, exactly. I just tell them to take fish oil tablets mm -hmm. and um, take two a day. Um, can I take the advantage of being the chair and ask about, I noticed that you didn't measure ANA and we've just recently been told that anti rho antibodies are a particular risk in uh, recurrent miscarriage. And I was wondering if you had a comment yeah. on that. So to, to, to measure anti rho antibodies, you need to do ENA. ENA, um, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, as part of the thrombophilia screen, um, you would do, um, you would look for um, antiphospholipid antibodies and things like that. And mm -hmm. I, I would usually do an ANA as part of that, the thrombophilia screen as well. Thank you. The rest of the questions are about progesterone, but I'm pretty sure you answered them. I, yeah. Oh, there was one about how long do you give it for? Yeah, um, usually usually till 10 weeks, which is a very good point um, mm -hmm. because after 10 weeks, the placenta takes over the production of progesterone. And so, and the reality is too, that most of these women are going to miscarry before eight weeks anyway. So if you make it through, although we say miscarriage occurs, you know, prior to 12 weeks, in my experience, if you get to 10 weeks and you've got a baby that's got a heartbeat, and is growing appropriately, you're extremely unlikely then to lose, or much less likely uh, to lose the ba the pregnancy and miscarry at that stage. So, um, yeah, so if you make it to 10 weeks, then you can stop it. Thank you. That's all the questions so far. Excellent. Um, so we're going to move on to ectopics. So this lady, 34, referred on the 6th of April, she'd had two vaginal deliveries and a spontaneous miscarriage. She wasn't quite sure when her last period was, but she thought she was about six weeks. She had had some vague lower abdominal pain the week before. Her HCG was 11,300 and ultrasound showed two hemorrhagic cysts in the left ovary and no intrauterine pregnancy. So the diagnosis here is pregnancy of unknown location, which almost always, so 90 plus percent of the time, is going to be a tubal ectopic. And here we have some pictures of the ultrasound. Um, so I'm just going to use my cursor to point at them. So here we have the right ovary here um, with a little cyst in it here. This is the left ovary, which they've reported as two hemorrhagic cysts. And the second one it doesn't show up particularly well in this film but was on sitting on top of this one here but you know there's also you can see there is actually a large mass here which is more than just the ovary um the other thing is um if we look over on the picture on the right you've got the uterus sitting in front here this is looking at, on a different angle this is the endometrium thickened here and you can actually see a black hole, which is in the pouch of Douglas. So she has got some blood in the pouch of Douglas. So um, this is an ultrasound which, you know, could easily be interpreted by someone else as saying she's got a left ma a mass in the left adnexum ad adherent to the ovary, and she's got some blood in the pouch of Douglas. So the most likely um, result of this, most likely diagnosis is that she's got a left ectopic pregnancy so it doesn't really matter though whether it, she's got a pregnancy of unknown location or an ectopic as we all know if she's compromised um, so if she has severe pain she's hemodynamically unstable she needs to go straight to ed no questions about that at all um, any woman that has lower abdominal pain in the reproductive age group has got an ectopic until proven otherwise. So she needs an HCG. But otherwise, the options for treatment are conservative, methotrexate or laparoscopy. So conservative treatment, if the HCG is less than 1,000, there's no fetal heart activity, 
she's pain free, she's non tender, and you've got a compliant patient, um, then that's she's suitable for that treatment as long as she's agreeable to that treatment. And initially, you just do the HCG every 48 hours with weekly follow up. But she must know that if she has any pain at all, she needs to report immediately to ED. Methotrexate we use quite a lot of. Um, if it's a, definitely a tubal ectopic, if she's hemodynamically stable, on ultrasound, the mass has to be less than four centimetres. There has to be no fetal heart activity and no significant hemoperitoneum. So on that ultrasound I just showed you, that wouldn't be considered significant hemoperitoneum. It is some hemoperitoneum, but not significant. The HCG less, needs to be less than 10,000 and they need to have minimal pain and be non-tender. But the most important one is the bottom one. They need to be compliant with this management. So you're probably not familiar with this. So I've just included a little bit of detail. So you need to check their bloods first of all, because even single shot methotrexate like this has been reported to cause um, immunosuppression, uh, bone marrow suppression. But you know we've been using it at St George now probably for the last fifteen years, and to my knowledge, we've not had anyone with that. The dose is calculated on surface area, so they come in um, to the gynae ward. They wait an hour after the dose to make sure they've not had a reaction. And then you check the HCG and the other bloods on days four and seven, because quite often after you give the methotrexate, the HCG goes on rising. And it's thought to be because you're getting lysis of cells and release of the HCG. And you expect that the HCG will decrease between days four and seven. And if it doesn't, then you do an ultrasound and think about a, a further dose. So in my lady, um, she didn't completely fit into those rules, but consider them more to be guidelines than absolute uh, rules. So she was hemodynamically stable. She had no pain. She was non-tender. She was compliant and she had not didn't have a significant hemoperitoneum. But it wasn't definitely a tubal ectopic and her HCG was greater than 10,000. So on, as I said, that day, the, it was 11,000. Two days later, when I sent her in to have the methotrexate, it was only slightly higher. But on day four, um, it had only dropped. I mean, sorry, it, was, it had dropped from the 11,000. But by day seven, it had only dropped by about 6.6%. .6%. She had had an ultrasound. Um, and we can see here, this is an ultrasound they did at the hospital. Um, just here we have the uterus sitting there and you have this mass, which was four centimetres. It looks enormous on this, but it wasn't that big. A four centimetre mass in the left at Nexum. So um, confirms what, we, what we'd seen, what we'd thought before. So, and this is what's happened to her. Um, so remember the last one I had in day seven was 9226. And um, I repeated it on four days later and it had halved. So I was very happy that my choice with that. However, her creatinine had gone up to 96. And um, so this was a little worrying and not, not usual with it. So I talked to um, my friendly um, renal physician who said he thought it would probably um, just due to some dehydration and would probably settle and he was quite right it did um, so three days later it was back to where it had been and the HCGs have continued to fall but I just would point out to you between on the last two on the fourth and then yesterday um, she was supposed to have one um, last week and this was my patient that I thought was very compliant and she didn't have one for some unknown reason. So it can be very concerning. So she's continued to have some spotting. She more bled more heavily after she had the ultrasound. She had the occasional cramp, but all this takes a lot of time. So we're now four weeks, 
uh, sorry, six weeks since her initial diagnosis. Um, if you do surgery, it's much more immediate. Um, but you have to tailor it to the conditions. So just to summarize that, ectopics, HCG doesn't rise as a normal pregnancy. The progesterone is low, so it's usually less than 30. So if it's less than 30, you know that you've got a non-viable pregnancy, whether it's a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy or an extrauterine pregnancy, you don't really know. You may not see an ectopic initially on ultrasound. If the HCGs are greater than 1,000, you should see an intrauterine sac on vaginal ultrasound, but you can sometimes get what's called a pseudo sac, um, where you just get some decidual change and it looks like a sac. And I just mentioned here using a woman's ultrasound practice. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, a normal radiology practice is not surprisingly um, staffed by radiologists. The woman's ultrasound practice, and there are four or five of them in Sydney, are staffed by obstetricians who started out as I did, but then specialised in ultrasound. So the sonographers just do women's ultrasound of their pregnancy and their, and their pelvis that's what they do all day. So um, they are better. The sonographers are better. And the obstetricians understand what we are looking for when we get the ultrasound. So what, what happens nowadays at the hospital, the hospital, if they have any re referring it for a tertiary um, view, they refer it to one of the women's ultrasound places. So... I don't think any of them are particularly better than others, but um, I think they're all better overall than a routine radiology practice. Important to realize though that the tube can still rupture if the HCG is falling and 50% of ruptures occur when the HCG is less than 1,000, which brings us on to the next point, which is you need patient compliance and they need to be close to where they're being managed. So it's no point having um, looking us at St. George looking after people down on the South Coast because that's just not um, safe. And for public patients, um, you have an early pregnancy assessment service. Um, most of the big hospitals will have uh, some, this, an early pregnancy assessment service or something similar. Our one at St. George runs 7.30 to 8.30 to Monday to Friday. No appointment or referral is needed. There's a registrar and a resident attend it, and there's a, a nurse there that coordinates it on, in, it's on, I mentioned the ward, it's on 1 West at, at St. George. They have access to two urgent ultrasound spots each morning, and they're useful for any bleeding or pain in early pregnancy or for the follow-up of HCGs as I've just described in this case. And they're often the easiest way for people outside the hospital to initiate that contact because you just send the woman in. Otherwise, you've got to send them to ED, um, which you do if they're compromised in any way. So just another brief, brief little case, which has got some nice pictures. Um, this lady... Uh, so she's had one pregnant, one baby, three pregnancies. She has a history of anchor vasculitis with renal involvement on Plaquenil. She's also on thyroxine because she's had has Hashimoto's. Um, she again, once again, she in her first pregnancy there were concerns about the growth of the baby. Her creatinine was rising. We induced her at thirty eight weeks, and she had a normal delivery of it. Again, another small baby. But then that's when it gets interesting. So last year, she had a right ectopic pregnancy. And remember, it's a right ectopic pregnancy and a salpingectomy. So she presented um, in August. So that's five, uh, three months later with pain and bleeding and six weeks pregnant. And this was her ultrasound at the time. So what you can see here is... This is her uterus here with a gestational sac, and you can see the rim 
of decidua around there, so looking the brighter area there. But what you can also see is this gestational sac here. Off, I promise you this is to the right, although it's very hard to get this con confusing. And you can see the little yolk sac sitting inside. So there's no fetal pole and no fetal heart activity, but she has another right ectopic pregnancy. So this is called a heterotopic pregnancy when she's got a pregnancy in the uterus and one um, in the tube as well. And here we have a picture of her with surgery. And just to orientate you, um, there's her uterus here. This is the right tube coming off. And you can see the swelling of the ectopic pregnancy. So what's happened is that she's had a salpingectomy, but they've left a stump at the cornu and the pregnancy, the embryos got into the stump as well. This is the ovary sitting here behind. And this stuff bludging out here is a mixture of blood clot and um, decidua as well. So, and then this is what it looks like after we've taken the tube off, nuked the area, so there's no chance of it ever happening again. And she's got a bit of, um, it's got a bit of blood clot sitting down here, over here, behind here again. So she had an ongoing pregnancy inside the uterus after we've done that. Um, an ultrasound at 37 weeks, the baby was a bit small and growing asymmetrically. She was induced at 39 weeks and had a vacuum and another small baby, 2.46 kilos. And interestingly, her creatinine just prior to birth was 85, the day after it had risen to 105. So once again, um, another question break, Martina. Thanks, Greg. So there's a few related to the different topics. So um, just going back to your first topic, just one more question about progesterone. Someone wanted to know if it was worthwhile um, testing beta-HCG and progesterone at the same time for viability of pregnancy. That's, I'm not sure if that's related to ectopic or just in yeah, general. No, no, I think I, that's what I do all the time. Right. So because um, so, I tell you, I mean, you know, if you've got a good progesterone and the HCG is rising, um, you know, doubling, then you can be very confident you've got a viable pregnancy. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I showed you in that first case, she actually had a pregnancy where the HCG was doubling, but the progesterone was low. Mm. So, you know, it, it just gives you something else. You can say to the woman, well, look, the, you know, we're happy that the, the HCG is rising well. But it is a concern. The progesterone is not not good, so we just have to um, wait and see. Uh, there's a question about the dose of methotrexate, but I think it's really an opportunity to say, like, GPs wouldn't be expected to be doing this management um, no, in sorry. their practices at all. No, absolutely they? not. No, yeah. I, mean, I think I think, and I think overall, this close follow up of HCGs and things like that. It has to be something you're doing all the time. Um, I didn't tell you because I thought you should be doing it in your practice. I told you about it because it is something different, probably that you haven't heard a lot about. Yeah. And it is, it is a whacking dose of methotrexate when you compare it to the sort of doses that you'd give in rheumatoid and, mm. and those sorts of things. Mm. So yeah. it's a really, it's a big intramuscular horse dose of it. So um you know, it. yes, I completely agree. I, you shouldn't be doing it in your practice. Having said that, a lot of women will go to their GP for reassurance while they're going through this prolonged process. And if we're familiar with the, with the protocol and have an expectation of timeline and that sort of thing, we can be a much more effective support person Absolutely. Um, for and, our and, patients. So, And I think, you know, that's why I made the point that it, it actually takes, it took six weeks. You yeah, know, and it's a long time um, to be bleeding, and so absolutely. And you know, if you understand that it is a long process, but the HCGs are falling nicely, then you you're reassured. What proportion of women would end up having their ectopic treated that way rather than surgically? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
sort of at St George, probably um, one and three, one and four, something like that. Um, so it's it's relatively high because um, it, it is surprising how many of them I like to do it. Mm. Well, yeah, well, no, are completely oh. asymptomatic. You know, don't have any pain. Um, they might have a little bit of bleeding, but don't have. And you, you examine them, and they're completely non-tender. Um, so they are very suitable for it. And you know, there, it's just different personalities. So some women, you say, you know, we've got to follow this for weeks and things, and they go, oh no, I don't want that. I just want to have this, have the operation and get it over and done with, and I'll be home tomorrow. So yeah. it really, you know, you've got to tailor it to the patient. And that's where compliance and proximity are really important. If they, you know, live a long way away or then you don't think they're going to follow your instructions, you're really forced to do surgery in that situation. Uh, do the women who've been treated with methotrexate have a higher chance of ectopic in the future? And like bearing in mind, we know that people who've had ectopics also have a higher chance of having one. So I think the question should be a higher chance than if they were treated surgically. Um, it's a, again, it's a really good question. And to my knowledge, I haven't read up about it for a while, but I don't think it is any higher um, than it than it than if they've had surgery. I mean, yeah. you're right, you're right, Martina. They do have an increased, you know, it has about a ten to fifteen percent risk of having another ectopic with the next pregnancy, and it's not higher than that. If they have um, methotrexate, do they get given a dose of folate the next day like we do with rheumatoid? Because no, you don't, don't want to turn off the effect of it. <laughs> no, 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 you, no, you don't. Um, I mean, the reason people came up with the idea of methotrexate is that's what it's used to, to treat trophoblastic disease. And mm. um, that is recurrent doses of methotrexate. And... Um, uh, so they use folinic acid rescue in that situation as well. But the single dose like this doesn't seem to be a problem. Greg, did you have another case? Because if you do, we probably should go through that one and then save the rest of the questions till later. Okay. Um, and I just, again, look, um, Martina mentioned this um, health pathway and it's a, an excellent summary as well. So I just wanted to finish with... Um, what I call the complications of pregnancy-related curatage, because this really does affect GPs a lot. It only happens after it's a pregnancy-related curate. So if a woman's having a hysteroscopy and curate for a polyp, it doesn't seem to cause it. But if they've had a curate for a miscarriage or retained products or a surgical termination, um, I'm not sure that I'll be able to show you. This is what a curate, when we do a suction curate, what it looks like. It's a hollow plastic tube. This is a 10 mil one, and it just has these divots cut out of the end. It's a very crude instrument, really, and it's a blind procedure. And if you push too hard, it you can put a hole through the fundus. And I delivered a, a lady last year who had a, um, a laparotomy and a bowel resection following a... Uh, curette where a perforation occurred at a hospital, not in our local health district, but not too far from here. Um, so that can happen. But more, more commonly, if you scrape too hard, you cause adhesions and that leads to no periods or very light periods and infertility. If you don't scrape hard enough, um, you leave bits behind and that cause persistent bleeding. So this is the first case she was completely normal, normal pregnancy, a spontaneous labor and normal delivery of a healthy baby and with a pl pl complete placenta. When she came back for her postnatal visit at six weeks, she was breastfeeding. She still had a bit of bleeding and she'd passed a clot the previous night. So I gave her some Augmentin and arranged for an ultrasound and she had retained products. She didn't want to do anything immediately she wanted to wait but we did it uh, two and a half weeks later we did a curette and it showed a moderate amount of tissue with no features of placenta accreta so what they mean by that is that sometimes if you can retain products it's because 
areas have actually started to invade the myometrium, which is placenta accreta, and that's why it hasn't come apart. So look at the times there. So seven months later, she went to see her GP because she hadn't had a period, and her GP quite sensibly did her reproductive hormones and did an ultrasound, which was normal. Then three months later, she still hadn't had a period, and she came to see me, and we did her hormones again, and I arranged for her to have a hysterosalpingogram, and they were unable to pass the catheter through the cervix. So the question was, did she have cervical stenosis and intrauterine head adhesions as a result of the curette? Now, I'm going to show you her, her hysteroscopy, but I needed to just make you familiar with what you're actually looking at. So this is a normal cavity. So we use fluid and these little white dots, are uh, just bits of tissue which have peeled off as we're going up. That's the right fallopian tube leaving there, the left fallopian tube. And these are just bubbles um, of air um, sitting up the front, at the top of the uterus. But you'll see the, the, the endometrium is this sort of pinky orange color, looks completely normal. So this is this lady. And the reason you can't see very much is I've just put the scope just inside the cervical os and there's this massive adhesion there. You can actually see there's a sort of dark area so that we're in the right place. That's where the cervical os is, but it's been closed off by the scar tissue here. And then as we go further up, this is a bit of um, tissue which is peeled off. But it, you can see this is the this black hole is the fundus up there, but you can actually see a rim of scar tissue going around here. So these are all adhesions inside the uterine cavity. And this is after we've broken down the adhesions. Um, it looks like sort of one of the sandworms from the movie Dune. But what this is, this is the fundus here. You can see the shadowing. You can't actually see it, the shadowing of the, of the ostium off there, the ostium going off that side. And so I did some bloods um, a week later. And just by sheer luck, um, although I told it was because I thought I'd guessed it, it wasn't that at all, though. I managed to do get her to do her bloods just at the time of ovulation. So you see her LH surge is happening. Her FSH is high as well. Her estrogen's high. Progesterone's starting to rise. So we've just got her at the time of ovulation. So she rang me a week later. So I very presciently said, you can expect to have a normal period in a week's time. She rang me back in a week to say she was having a normal period. Um, and what I've asked her to do is to actually call with the next one and then we'll do another hysteroscopy just to make sure there there be, or oh, I've got rid of all the adhesions there. So this is the reverse situation. Another lady, 32-year-old woman. Um, so she this was an IVF pregnancy with a fresh transfer. I saw her at eight weeks. She'd had no bleeding, did a scan, and the fetal pole was only equivalent to six weeks and four days size. There was no fetal heart activity, so she had a missed miscarriage. She had a previous biochemical pregnancy. She had a very complicated past medical history. She had had a renal transplant in 2011 for chronic interstitial nephritis. She had Wolf Parkinson White syndrome and was seeing a cardiologist for this. She'd had a bladder augmentation in 2012 and then a bladder rupture and repair. So very complicated. So I didn't do this curette. She had a suction curette on the 6th, but she had persistent bleeding after this. And she had an ultrasound six weeks later, which was, and they thought that she had retained products. Her HCG at the time was negative, And it's one, the other thing that you need to think of if she's got persistent bleeding after a curette whether she has trophoblastic disease. So very important to check her HCG. So she had a hysteroscopy and curette on the 14th. And this is a view, it's a little blurry, but um, what you can see, you can see the that pinky orange color of the normal endometrium. 
and this white junk here is products of conception which is um come away so um she had a curate at the time and interestingly she just rang me this morning so this was on the 14th she rang me this morning on on the 16th to say that she hadn't had a period so my heart sank a bit um just a bit because she normally has very regular cycles hoping that i haven't gone the other way and we've now got ashermans so um in summary it only occurs after pregnancy related curette and most of these women will see their gp first so messages really if bleeding persists more than seven to ten days they need an ultrasound for retained products if they have amenorrhea or light periods or are not getting pregnant after they've fallen pregnant easily previously then they had, need to have a hysterosalpingogram um, they also asked in for a way of contacting um, people at the hospital um, the only one really that we have is our num of um, so or well, she's called a mum actually and the midwifery unit manager um, of clinics is a lady called Noreen Murray who's incredibly helpful um, and she can be contacted if you ring switch and ask to page her and I actually cleared it with her and, and when I was giving preparing this talk and she's happy to take take calls thank you very much and any more questions Martina We've got about two minutes to go, Greg. Yep. Um, <laughs> I told you I'd stick to time. <laughs> oh, you did really well, I have to say. Um, there was a question just clarifying when you were talking about tenderness with the ectopic pregnancy. We yep. presume you meant abdominal tenderness. Abdominal not, tenderness, not yeah. Tenderness, yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a comment about people who are having trouble affording going to a woman's ultrasound practice. Uh, I, look, I, I totally agree with that. That's that's a real problem and mm. I don't know the answer to that dilemma um, because all of them are much more expensive and they certainly don't bulk bill um, so you I mean you just have to you know cut your cloth I mean some of the the more established um, ultrasound places like um, Glenn and Partners provide a good service and they're a bit cheaper but again they don't bulk bill I don't think so the trouble with the bulk bill places um, is generally they are down the lower end of in terms of quality of ultrasound. So I, I, it is a, a dilemma. And um, and the fact is that uh, the process of doing an ultrasound is much more time consuming than taking an X-ray or a CT. So yeah. the Medicare rebate probably isn't sufficient really for what's in what is needed. So yeah, and and you know if they if they're doing a pelvic ultrasound it means they need to do a transabdominal one and a vaginal one as well mm. so, so mm. it's a lot more complicated mm. uh, there's a question about if a woman's had a salpingectomy for ectopic and has a higher chance of recurrence should she be recommended to have IVF no because um she could still get an ectopic well <laughs> yeah actually you know the normal incidence of ectopic pregnancy is one in 90 um but it 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 is actually significantly higher in ectopic in ivf pregnancy which you know because when they when they put an, an embryo back inside the uterus they can sometimes flush it into the tube so if she's got those stumps of tubes there then she can flush it back into that tube um so it doesn't really reduce the risk uh, re reduce the risk at all um, and the last question, if the beta HCG is less than a thousand, that's not really indicating at what stage of pregnancy is ultrasound useful in diagnosing an ect oh in, in an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, so yeah, I mean it, yeah, I mean, I think you know the guidelines they have when when you get a, a report from the lab saying this is equivalent to five to six weeks and things like that. I mean, I, I I don't find them particularly useful at all because you just got to take each pregnancy, you know, by itself and and stand alone really, um, and it really it's the trend of what's happening in the HCG. And you've seen, I've seen lots of pregnancies where 
the HCGs have sort of limped along and then taken off. And similarly, like I showed in that one where the HCG was taking off, but she ended up with a miscarriage. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you're not sure what's going on, she needs an ultrasound. You know, if it's just bumbling along and it's not getting better, it's not going up or down, then she can be managed conservatively. But I think it needs to be done. You need to be sending her either to, a, you know, pri if she wants to go privately or you need to be sending her to, to the APAS. Yeah. For them to monitor. And it's just, if you're not doing it a lot, it's just not worth the anxiety, you know, that, you know, are you sure? Uh, you know, if something goes wrong in that situation and she goes into ED with a ruptured ectopic, you know, you're going to feel awful. Whereas, um, you know, if, if if they've been looking after an EPAS and they'll probably feel awful too, but, you know, um, hopefully they will have been through it and explained it to them and things like that. So there's a shifting of the risk, you know, a broadening of the responsibility there as well, rather than just being on one person. And the details about the EPAS are on the health pathways. So hopefully people will be able to find it um, to use well, the service. It's a great service to be able to have for early pregnancy problems and concerns. Absolutely. Greg, thank you so much. You've stuck to time. There's a yep. couple more questions, but we've come to time. So we'll forward them and um, we can send answers to those questions uh, wow. with the notes. There's, yeah, thank, um, but thank you very much to everybody that's um, participated tonight. We had uh, nearly 90 participants, Greg, so it was very popular. <laughs> so thank you very much for what you've done. Okay. Pleasure. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Martina Gleason, for facilitating and Associate Professor Greg Davis, thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, don't forget that we will be sending the evaluation survey um, that will pop up on your screens as soon as we close the webinar and join us next month on the 20th of June for a rehab talk. Thank you very much and good night, everybody. <laughs>